Okay, today we're going to have a look at something that's really, really important in helping us to understand why people take on new technology, why they take on new IT services. Bearing in mind that when we talk about IT services, it's the whole end-to-end -end experience, rather than just that little app that's sitting on the smart device. It also takes account of the things that are going on in the background. It thinks about not just technology, but people side, processes, habits, all the things that actually fit together into doing something of value to somebody. It kind of relates back to the topic of your assignment. And up this afternoon, um, a lot of the time going to be about what is your topic for your assignment, giving you some ideas, perhaps uh, you're giving me ideas, and then we'll kind of refine, for each of you, you'll try and refine the topic if you haven't already sorted out what the service is going to be that you're going to deliver with location services and think about the problems with the accuracy of location services. But the question then is, okay, so we've de developed this magical app that's going to go on somebody's smart device, smartphone, tablet, who knows. But what's going to make them actually use it? Because we know from statistics that huge numbers of people download apps. And if you look at the average person, they've got lots and lots and lots of apps on their uh, tablet or their smartphone. And they use it for about a day or so and then say, oh, no, I'm not going to use it again. And maybe they'll delete it, maybe they won't, maybe they'll just clutter up the screen a bit. But the research which I'm going to briefly lead you through today about the te technology acceptance models and its later derivatives help us to understand why it is that people don't actually carry on and use it. And one of the conference presentations last week out in Palo Alto was looking at the question of where next? How do we think about the context around the location of that person and their connected devices such as Fitbits and so on and so forth? Particularly not the context, the physical context, but the what the guy called the cognitive context. Where's the person's brain? What are they thinking about? What are they trying to achieve? And he was looking at the question of how there's this huge sort of wave of enthusiasm, vast numbers pile in and pick up something, pick up a Fitbit or and then Someone adds a little bit of a gamification to the app that goes with it to try and encourage them to keep on using this to get some, perhaps, benefit in the longer term, getting fitter, losing weight, whatever it is that they're trying to achieve. And yet, something like 90 to 95% of people quite rapidly give up using that particular thingy. And part of it is to do with the gamification process and major flaws in the way that people jump in on this new topic called gamification, making it fun behind the hard work of running and running and exercising or whatever else it is. So, what's going on? Why are people dropping out like they do? What I want to think about today is looking at the concepts of the TAM and thinking about it in, the term, in terms of those top two levels of the Zachman Enterprise Architecture because that kind of gives you the feel at the owner level and whether you look at it at the owner from the perspective of the provider or the owner as the person with the gadget. Questions are, what encourages us to use these things, other than just pure novelty, oh, I'll have a look at it and see, but rather than just the trying it out, but moving on to the continuous use of the technology, of the app, of whatever we're talking about. And the second point 
is to think about what are the challenges, the things that stop, actually discourage us from continuing to use these things. <coughs> so we'll look at some research, which is quite interesting. Um, in the overall context, the IT services management, A, top two levels of Zachman Enterprise Architecture, the planner, the owner. So you can say the planner, in this sense, the planner is the, the people who put together the app and the, that connects to the Fitbits or the location services or whatever it is you're doing. And you could look at it in this context, the person who actually owns that physical little device that you are thinking about a new IT so location services based uh, activity or app is going to help them to stay with it, using it. So planner you can interpret here as the provider of the app. The owner level is you guys or whoever's got the, the device in their hand. And remember that the IT product design module is very much related to the, the levels below. How do you actually get it happening? So, and remember, we're basically working at this level, but you might, at some stage, need to drop down a couple of levels to, um, to the IT product design sort of ideas at the designer and builder level, because that's where, in a sense, some of the technology decisions need to be made and you'll, you'll see that in, I think it's section two of your assignment you've got to think about the types of technology that will wrap around the service to deliver the, the, the service you're trying to uh, produce. Now the technology acceptance model, model coming from a guy called Davis in 1989 is, was the first pass at trying to find out why aren't people taking on board things like, back in those days, um, email in the mainframe environment typically, or perhaps occasionally in the PC level, but there wasn't a lot of email back then. And he came up through some research with this model, that there are a whole set of things that help us, that are, you might say are external, to do with ourselves, to do with the way we think, to do with the way we behave do with the way we assess aspects of this app, this device, this thing <coughs> that helps us ultimately to the end bit of actual use and perhaps which we're looking for continuous uh, productive valuable use. And he came up with a couple of interesting things to do with perception, the things going on in the user's head, the way they think about is it useful and is it easy to use. And I guess that product design, um, in that module, Dennis is kind of asking you questions about ease of use, the way to make the design very, very intuitive. So because you don't have to think hard about it. It's not complicated. You don't keep going round and round in circles and you make no, um, uh, no progress. But it's easy to get to where you want to be and do the thing you want to do. And he proposed in this model that you have the perception of usefulness and the perception of the ease of use help to develop a positive attitude towards using it. So I think it might be useful, it looks easy to use, so hey, I think I might try it out. And between those two, there's an attitude that sort of kind of develops into, oh, not only do I think I might want to use it, but hey, I'm actually going to. So to turn it into an actual activity, I'm going to start using it. And that leads on to, now I've met, downloaded, installed it, now I'm going to start using it. So this was developed, as we say, back in 1989. A couple of little definitions. <coughs> the, the perceived usefulness is, the degree to which a person believes that using a particular system or gadget or service would enhance his or her job performance. So you can see that this is in the corporate environment back in 1989. Because there was a lot of development back then uh, of systems, mainframe systems mainly, but a bit of server-based type of stuff coming along. And we were really in the middle of a major drive towards the use of IT 
in business, to try and make business more productive. And then the other point was the definition that Davis used was perceived ease of use is the degree to which a person believes that using a particular system will be free from effort. Now I guess that second one kind of relates very much to what Dennis is trying to teach you in IG um, product development. Yeah, as you build your mock-ups, it must be intuitive, it must be obvious, there mustn't be things in the way of doing um, you know, behavioural aspects of the, of the device or of the interface that really irritates. It must be free from effort and that I would add on free from irritation. I was looking at a website today where it's got lots of little icons, well, biggish icons with words in them and as you bring your mouse up to click on it, a little pop-up kind of hover over window opens up and at the top of that is the uh, active URL you can click on. You can't click on the icon itself. Oh no, you've got to wait until the hover over comes up and then find the link to click, which is kind of bizarre. Effort, uh, causes effort, causes irritation. And so, part of what he did, he was looking at the use of email, things in the IBM environment like Profs, which is an IBM mainframe based with, uh, email system. And these are the sort of questions that he asked in terms of perceived usefulness. Does it make my job easier? So we're coming from a corporate business environment here. And so you're going to have to interpret this a little bit into the context of maybe business or it could be in terms of recreational use. It just depends what you're trying to do with your service you're developing. So think about these sort of questions and there's a few more on the next page. But you know, if you look at some of them, <clears throat> is, my, would, is my job difficult if I don't have this? Is my life difficult if I don't have this? Or turn it around, does this make my life easier? Does it give me more control? Does it improve my performance? So if you're looking at a Fitbit type of thing, does it help me to get fitter, to achieve my aims, to do, I don't know, a marathon next year perhaps? These are sort of things there. Does it save time? Back then, no spam emails, so it wasn't too bad. Today, how many irrelevant emails do we have pouring into our mail baskets all the time? Depends how really nearly we are with handing our email out to websites. There is that point. You know, if we hand out our email to things, it's going to get there. And it's actually quite interesting that you know, with, with our once you get into the professional level, once you get a job and you have your own web page, do you put your email, contact email there visible or do you have a little text box type of little app that sort of, that you can get to put into your uh, web systems that says contact me, put your email address in there, here's a t box in which you can type your text in and then behind the scenes it emails off to you. Off to, to you. So you've got to debate there as to how, how much you want your email address around the big wide world. Can I do things more quickly? Does it support critical aspects that I want to achieve, whether in my job or in my recreation, my personal life? Does it help me to do more than I would be able to without it? Does using electronic mail, this is a really interesting one, looking at the change over the last 25 years, roughly. Does electronic mail reduce the time I spend on unproductive activities? And I suspect most of us will probably say today, no it doesn't because I get so much other else that I have to deal with that it slows me down. Does it improve my effectiveness, the quality of the work, my productivity, and so on. So those were the questions that he posed to, uh, in a big survey, to try and characterise what was going on in the way that people looked at the introduction of this new technology. And then ease of use, these are the sort of questions, am I getting confused, am I making mistakes, <coughs> am I frustrated by interacting with it, do I need the user manual, I mean that leads to the question, where is the user manual these days? Oh, it's on a PDF. 
written in rather low quality, low grade English. It's very, very confusing. Uh, if I can track down the website where this product comes from, and maybe there'll be a little manual that someone's put together, or maybe they haven't. How much mental effort? Is it easy that when I make a mistake, I can actually recover from it, or do I have to start all over again? How rigid and inflexible are they? And it's easy to get it to do what I want it to do, which might not be what it was designed to do, but remember. So some questions about that. So these are the sort of questions, those, on those last three slides, the sort of questions you will need to be posing to yourself just to solve those first two questions, perceived ease of use and perceived usefulness. Because you need to solve both of those before you actually release a product out into the wild. Oh, even more questions, so keep going. Lots more interesting questions that you need to add in. Now, what he discovered was rather interesting. People were much more likely to use a system if they felt that it was actually going to be useful. Because if it was really useful, they would cope with some of the difficulties of the ease of use. And so, rather than having something that's easy to use but has no obvious purpose, you need to concentrate on making something that is actually of long-term usefulness. And it doesn't really matter whether it's just for recreational use on a smartphone or whether it's for a business use. And if you think about the projects you're all working on in Teams now, on Clive's pro uh, module. One of the other things you need to be asking your client is how useful is this? What is its purpose? Is it going to be seen to be useful? So as you start developing those projects with your clients, I would strongly encourage you to come back to this lecture or the seminar material and start applying it as a sets of questions. You'll need to tailor the questions to be uh, more specific to your project, but this will actually help you to get something that's really <coughs> valuable that will be used in the long term. Now, it's kind of interesting to see the date here because this is three or four years after I developed <coughs> project management, or led the development of project management system at, at Rolls-Royce where we were managing half a million activities on a project. And that system, after we had developed in conjunction with the end users, in an iterative process, day by day, cycling round on the 30, 60 day cycle, this project management system was designed and developed and implemented with extreme usefulness. It did the job that nothing else would do and that was necessary to improving the productivity of the project management group, the resource management group, the task management group. It did everything that they wanted it to do. And because it was so useful and we tried to design it as far as possible to be easy to use as well, that system was then used for the best part of 15 years um, almost unchanged. It was the thing that held the organization together in project and program management terms. So think about usefulness. Go and ask your clients about usefulness. What's it going to be doing for? Why is it going to be useful to your organization, to the staff in your organization, your clients? Because if you can get those answers, you will be able to be certain that all the effort you're putting in over the next few months is going to lead to something that's actually going to be used and will make a significant contribution to those organizations who are your clients. Yeah, it still means that ease of use is important, but that's the simple part. You've got to get the usefulness really solved. And once you've got the usefulness solved, then it is going to be used significantly.
This links back to the Standish Group type of reports, the chaos re uh, reports that Standish Group publish every year or two. <coughs> that functionality is really important, and if you end up with a system that only has a little bit of the functionality that's really required to do the job effectively, then you've really got problems about its usability and its usefulness. So if we look at the challenge projects in standards group terms, which perhaps have only got 8% of the functionality that people are expecting to have, or have had in the past, that's a real problem for them. That's a project that delivers 40% of the agreed functionality, which is probably only 20% of the functionality that they're used to using because of the Preto effect of 20% of the tasks that you can provide all the functionality actually delivers about 80% of the workload. And so you sort of make people more efficient, get rid of the un unproductive 20% that's used once every year perhaps, concentrate on the core. That's great if that's the fully delivered. But if you have a challenge project which only delivers 40% of the greed functionality, 40% of 20% is 8%, and that's real problems. So functionality is also important. You have to deliver the functionality the customer needs and signs up for if your system is going to be used effectively. Now, he then did a little bit more research. One of his, um, I think it was a PhD student, Venkatesh, did some work a bit later on in the 1990s and upgraded the uh, externality factors to try and see what else was going on in terms of driving perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use. <coughs> and so instead of having just a couple of boxes, one box there and one box there, it, they kind of split it up to give a little bit more richness so we can begin to understand more about the things that might affect people's ideas. And so it could be a whole range of factors like that. And they did some research around those uh, areas. Uh, Am I being forced to do it, or can I make a choice? How much experience on the job have I got? A lot, or a little? The subjective norm kind of refers a little bit back to one of the question, one or two of the questions on that email survey um, about how do others around me feel about doing this. So in the corporate environment, the fact that more and more people were using email kind of provided the norm that we're going to use it, folks, because it's helpful to us all. Is it relevant to the job? Do I get better quality in terms of the work I'm doing by using this tool? And so the subject in norm is, again, relates to the image I have of myself and the image that you guys have about me. So it's a sort of two-way, how do we think about each other in relation to the subjective norm? Are we kind of a group together, or are some people standing out over there really great, but also very helpful, or is there one or two down here who are really anti and really bullshit and we don't get on well with them? So there's all sorts of things about image that can affect how we then see this perceived usefulness. And they did quite a bit of work and validated this model, TAM2. There's a list of uh, the papers that were published around this at the back of the last slide. And if you look at this one, you can actually see on page 202 of the article, uh, when I say two, it's not an article that long, but it's um, where it's published. Page 201 has the, their bibliography and has at the end of it, but it also has a list of all of the questions that help them to de develop those extra, quest uh, extra boxes. Again, those may be relevant to what you're doing with your project, <coughs> but then a little bit later on, Venkatesh and other people with Davis, if I remember correctly, started doing yet more work. And rather than moving to TAM3, they then came up with this idea, this title, the Unified United Theory of acceptance and use of technology. And the UTAUT has now been developed to the second and th I think third um, version as a 
give a richer and richer version of what's happening down here. So as you can see, they're actually still only looking at the first two boxes in the sequence in TAM. So you've still got intention to use an actual use out here somewhere. Subtle changes, they're putting behavioral intention, intention to um, use in front of the actual use behavior. So there's stuff going on in here which is kind of hidden at the moment. So have a look at those. Again, um, a whole set of uh, lists of the factors and the questions that drive it. So what I want you to do for the next 15 minutes or so is to do this lot. Find all the articles that are on the bibliography on the next page. Those are the ones that define it. Define TAM, TAM2, UTA, UT, UTA, U2, 2, and perhaps 3. But I want you to do more than that. I want you to do some research in the academic journals to find articles post-2004 or 5 which actually critique TAM, UTA, UT model. Are they good? Are they bad? Are they useful? Are they relevant? Why are they relevant? Why are they helpful? And then the third part is actually to apply all of this into the development of your assignment. Because all of this stuff, all the questions posed in these various slides and that page two, about 201 and 400 and whatever it was, all those questions that they used in their surveys are questions that you can use both in this assignment and you can use it in IT product development and you can use it in team project and the work you're doing there. Because it will help you to develop and deliver better products that are more useful and more usable, leading to more activity and more use and sustained use of those products. Because it's kind of nice if you end up with a project where you know, where you find out a year, two, three, four, five years later, that they're still using your system. And I mean, for me, it was really very, very interesting as, as an undergraduate apprentice in my at the end of my first year at university, I went back to work for Rolls-Royce <coughs> and I designed a small thing, small system that allowed one of Rolls-Royce's big commercial customers to do th something specific. And that went into the system a year later, roughly, after I'd uh, gone away back to university. Somebody took on the specification, implemented it, and that was working 10, 15 years later. It was still known as the system. And you know, it's, it's kind of cool when you see something you designed as an undergraduate student is in use productively in business for many, many years. And the stuff you're doing with Clive could be like that, folks. So I encourage you to really take on board all of the stuff we've talked about in the last three, four, five weeks. So that's all going to help you to do better pro uh, projects. There's this integration across all of these projects. And of course, you can pick up stuff you're doing with databases as well, because that kind of helps you about fine level detail stuff. But the stuff we're talking about is higher levels, thinking about the planner, the owner, uh, the users, to make life really a lot, lot more interesting. So you've got five sources here. You should be able to pick them up either by the hot links or by searching in the, uh, our resources, our Athens Authenticated Resources, and you will easily be able to get the MIS Quarterly and Management Science uh, articles with no difficulty whatsoever. So that's what I want you to do for the next 15 minutes, and then we'll briefly talk about how you're going to do, or what you're going to be doing in the, uh, after two o'clock, which is individual discussions about your own assignment, folks. Okay? Get to it, you've got a lot to do. Five articles to find, load onto your memory stick or wherever, 
and then start doing these acti the activities on the pre preceding page. Okay, folks, thanks. <laughs>